I want to take a few minutes first. Let's do something together. Let's welcome our two candidates to tonight's platform. Again, we want to thank LACNIP and St. Lutheran's St. Luke's Church for hosting us and being involved in this electoral process. This, this is the candidates forum for the position of mayor of the city of Lima. The candidates, as you know, are Ms. Smith to my right and Ms. Hardesty to my left. We are here for about an hour and a half. Um, we're asking you as the audience to re refrain from supporting or negating your candidate tonight until the end when we will celebrate both of them. As if, in fact, we have a situation where that might occur, I'll probably take a time out and give ourselves a moment to regroup and so we can move forward. Why is this important? Because I just counted 45 questions, all right? Is it realistic for me to get through 45? Probably not. But let me share with you some of the topic areas of where your questions are leading. The topic of policing. The topic of housing, population retention and growth, and selling the city of Lima. The topic of county city shared services, and how will you work with our elected government officials at the state level. Labor unions versus the right to work. Neighborhood associations and why are they important and why and how can we engage them to support our youth? What is your leadership style and what skills do you really bring to the table to be the next mayor of Lima? Which could include things like budgeting, community relations, et cetera. As the mayor of Lima, what do you see the rule, role of the city and the schools working together? And where does volunteerism fit into that relationship? We then have a series of questions that are related to COVID and the changing connections to the finances of COVID and the health and safety of employees and workers. And then a few questions as well on workforce development. Now, that was me taking those 45 questions and kind of categorizing them pretty quickly. As we're answering some of these questions tonight, I'm going to look a little farther into a couple of the other questions that we received, see if I missed any topics, and bring them back to you. We flipped a coin earlier. Ms. Smith has the privilege of being able to answer the first question. She will have two minutes to answer the first question, and then Ms. Hardesty will have two minutes to follow. At, at the end of her two minutes, Ms. Smith will have the right for a rebuttal, excuse me, for a rebuttal, and then Ms. Hardesty the same. If they choose not to, that's fine. Um, we have our timekeeper up front. She'll keep us moving and give us a ding if we're, we hit the time limit on either piece of those, uh, the timing piece. Let's see. And we're luck, very lucky this evening to be able to share this with the city of Lima through uh, local channel 44 and I believe some other entities that are present. All right, so we're gonna begin. And since there seem to be some focus on our youth tonight, and since we are at a neighborhood association meeting, I think it's reasonable for us to start with that question. What, where do you see the value of the neighborhood associations in relationship to supporting the city of Lima, but also in relationship to supporting the youth in our community? With respect to our neighborhood associations, I see neighborhood associations as a very important and valued partner in our community for several reasons. Um, particularly where it pertains to the youth, they give youth an opportunity to connect with community, to get to know community, for opportunities to volunteer, and also opportunities to be exposed to what is happening here in our neighborhoods. I know that the city of Lima has a long history of supporting neighborhood associations by providing 
providing direct support in terms of employee support, but also in terms of technical support with respect to paying for trainings for neighborhood association leaders to uh, go on to learn different best practices across the country and bring those best practices back to our community to be able to use those to help our community grow. As mayor, I will continue that practice. Um, with respect to the youth, I think to attract youth in our community, we have to invest in good jobs. Um, youth are concerned about jobs. They are also concerned about avenues for entertainment and avenues for things such as live music and more recreation. And those are some of the things that our neighborhood associations can help us with respect to partnerships to make our community more attractive to our youth. Thank you. Sure. So I would say as far as neighborhood associations, it's very important to have those here in the city of Lima. The ones that are established give opportunity to both the youth and other people living in that neighborhood association. They give the volunteer opportunities to keep their neighborhood both safe and clean. They give homeowners pride in what they're doing in order to be part of that neighborhood association. Here in Lima, we definitely have families that come from all different backgrounds. We also have families of all different demographics. And so neighborhood associations can also, especially for youth and young adults, decide to provide role models. So maybe you're living with your grandparents and you need a dad figure in your life. Neighborhood associations can help provide that. And I think that's a huge thing that this community as a whole can look for. I also feel that we can provide opportunities for mentorship as well as not only in school and passing your classes, as well as getting into the trades and possibilities of what you're gonna do after high school or even after middle school to make sure you make it through a vocational program or through high school. So you come out ready to give and add to this community. I would also like to say that as far as neighborhood associations and mentorships, you would also give these kids life skills. So not only teaching them to balance a budget, teaching them to be respectful to their elders, helping them be part of the community. I mentioned taking pride in your home, keeping it clean, keeping your grass cut, and all of that. So I think neighborhood associations are very important to the entire city. I am excited to hear that the Fifth Ward is looking into creating one, and that will be wonderful. And I think it's a great, great thing for kids to happen and be a part of. Ms. Smith, do you have a follow-up to that? No. no. Ms. Hardesty? No. Okay. Thank you. The next question has uh, tentacles in the housing and community development, community growth area, and it will be answered first by Ms. Hardesty. How do we grow the city of Lima population and encourage investment in housing in our community. I think as far as population growth, we have a multitude of opportunities to grow here in Lima. We need to work on not only getting our high school graduates who might leave to go to college, get them excited and encourage them to come back, be part of their hometown. I think we also have a great opportunity with the colleges here in town to keep these youth here, get them good jobs as hopefully the programs and many of them do lead right into the industries and the job opportunities we have here in town. So we need to make sure that we keep them here. We do need to make sure that we have acceptable housing for them. We need to make sure that if they have a family or they decide to get married right after college, we have starter homes at a reasonable price that are one or two bedroom that they're going to be proud to own. It also helps them build equity. There's tons of positives to that. As far as further with the housing and how we want people here, there are multitudes of what we need to do in order to fix housing here. I mentioned starter homes. We also need to have senior citizen housing so that the people who raise their families in these big, large houses that we are blessed to have here in Lima have a place to go that they can live on one floor. So we need to make sure that we keep them here in the city and that they have the opportunity to still be homeowners. That's part of that generation's pride is being a homeowner. So we need to make sure we have those opportunities. And I also think for renters and landlords, we need to look at having some incentives to being in the city. If you are part of the community and in Lima area and you are a landlord, what incentives can we as a government provide to you to encourage you to keep those houses up to a certain standard and keep them, keep the tenants 
people that are going to be quality and provide for the community. So number one, I think that housing is a critical issue that the next mayor is going to address um, because it really leads to the pride that individuals have in our in our community. And it's also one of the first things that people see when they come into our community. But some of the facts that are surrounding housing are, number one, we have aging housing stock. And so many of our houses were built before the 1930s, and that means that there is a significant amount of rehabilitation that needs to be completed with respect to our housing. The other issue that we have is an affordability issue. Um, although unemployment prior to COVID-19 st uh, stayed at around four and a half, five percent, we still have about 25 percent of people that live in our community um, that live in poverty. So they're working, but they cannot afford to um, buy a home. The other thing that we have, and we've seen it more and more over the past couple of years, is there's been a pent up market for market rate housing. And so as mayor, I will propose a solution to address all of these issues. Um, one of those is providing funding to help individuals um, buy homes, but also providing funding for rehabilitation of those homes, um, for our seniors to be able to age in place, but also providing funding to developers to go into our neighborhoods, particularly those that have the 700 or so vacant lots throughout our neighborhood to do infield development as well. I think when you take care of the housing, you make us, our city more attractive, which could also um, invite more people to want to move here and to come into the city of Lima. Thank you. Ms. Hardesty? I would just like to simply say that I feel that this administration, as long as it's been in office, has taken the definition of affordable housing and defined it as subsidized housing. And I think we needed that 30 years ago. We're not at the point where we need that now. We need to use our land bank to build houses that people can own, families can live in, and that they're proud to have. Thank you. Ms. Smith? So when I talk about affordable housing, I'm not talking about low to moderate, low, um, income housing. I am talking about the fact that the majority of people in this community spend more than 30% of their income on housing, which is the definition for affordability based on HUD. We need a whole spectrum of housing, from middle housing for uh, middle wage workers. We also need housing for seniors to age in place. We need live work communities for artists and creatives that want to come in our community to live as well. And so when I talk about affordability, it's not tied to just low to moderate income. It's tied to a full spectrum of housing for all individuals within our community in every one of our neighborhoods. Thank you. The next question is for Ms. Smith. And it focuses on skills and abilities and tools and resources that candidates bring to the mayoral position. What tools do you have or can you use to sell Lima to new faces, current Lima residents, and the youth who are returning or may return to our community. So let me just say, when I made the decision to run for mayor, it was not an easy decision for me to make. And I prayed about it, and I really did not make the decision until I felt like I had the skills and I'd done the work to be able to do the job on day one. So with respect to attracting individuals that come into our community, I would first start by selling one of the greatest assets in our community is our people. It is the hard work and the resilience of our people that has gotten us over the past two or three decades to the point that we are now to where we can really see real progress that is coming out of the ground. With respect to businesses, I will talk about, you know, our location on I-75. I will talk about our water resources. I will talk about how we are close to the rail so that goods can get in and out of our community. The other thing that I bring to the table is I have a track record of building coalitions, a track record of working across the aisle with people that don't always agree with me to come to solutions that work best for our community. I did that in the community that I was in before. I've been doing that since I came back home. I've, I've done it to establish a after school program that's now served over 100 youth that involve not just our schools, but also, also our mental health partners as well, and even our economic development partners 
partners. I've worked with them as well to help bring investments into our community. So I say the number one thing that I bring is the ability to work with different people to come up with solutions that work best for our community. Thank you. Ms. Hardesty? I bring something different. I bring an idea for change. I bring an idea to do things completely a different way than where we have been going. Um, I came back and I've been here and watching my hometown kind of go downhill and down a path that hasn't been very successful recently. And yeah, we have positive projects going on. We have lots of th good things going on. A lot of that's due to private equity and investors, private investors. Not a lot has to do with the government. So I think that we need to take a step back, reevaluate some policies and procedures, and make sure we look at how our government is helping the people. Are they really doing that? Personal skills I bring into this deal as wanting to be mayor. I bring in a strong business background. I worked for 15 years in oil and gas. I am successful. I know how to manage a project. I know how to manage a budget. I know how to work with people and create a team. I know how to make people work together. I understand every in and out of doing business and conducting business with international companies. And we talk about bringing jobs here that are well paying. Those are the type of companies we need to bring here. We need the international factories. We need the international IT companies. Think IT company from India moving into the old Walmart building. That would be wonderful. So we need to make sure that I've got these skills, I need to make sure that I use these skills in order to talk at the table and bring these international companies here. Some of the highlights Lima has, my opponent mentioned the infrastructure. We do have easy access to airports, railroads, as well as the highways. We are centrally located in the US for the most part, and that's a wonderful asset that we can bring. So a lot of these companies I think will look at our community as a opportunity to expand into the U.S. as well as to have a local place that they can thrive in and their employees can live and hopefully in safe neighborhoods. Ms. Smith, do you have a follow-up? Yes, contrary to what my opponent is attempting to project, the investments that are going on in our community are a result of both public and private investment. In fact, the investments that are happening in our downtown now started with seed money that the city put in to re- habilitate the bank building. Road State College, the city was working to assemble those parcels. If you go back 15 years ago, it was the city who led the way to where we now have the new Lima Senior Campus. So the results that we have now is a result of both public and private investment. And in addition to my experience working for the last four years in this community, not just in city government, but with many of you as community partners being involved in youth um, youth um, initiatives, being involved in cleanup initiatives, being involved in working with others to attract even businesses. I've proven that I have the heart, I have the skill, and I have the ability to do what's needed for our next mayor to keep us moving forward in this community. I would just simply say that yes, the city has had a little part in most of those, but the majority of the money, including for Lima Stadium, came from private investors here in town. The project ideas came from private citizens who want to see the city grow and thrive and be great again. So also think in mind as to the red tape that the city offers, how many projects have not happened? I've heard of many of them. And so I think that we definitely need a new way of doing things. Ms. Smith, the fourth question will be for you initially. Um, and I think we're going to focus on, let me find it here, um, leadership style and background that supports that. So there are several pieces to this question, so please catch those as we walk through them. How is your leadership style unique and what background do you have that your voters don't know about that would be helpful in your career as mayor, as well as speak to any personal weaknesses that you see in your leadership? So I'll hit those three things again. Leadership style, or maybe four. Leadership style, how is it unique? What about your background is unknown to the community that would assist you in being a good mayor? And what is a personal weakness? 
and how will you handle that? Having been um, coming, particularly having come to city government um, in a leadership position four years ago, um, being the new person on the team, bringing fresh eyes and a new perspective to city government and wanting to change everything right now. Um, I've learned that when you want to create change, the first thing you have to do is be able to get people to get behind your vision. And so to do that, number one, you have to make sure that you have all the people in the room that are necessary to be in the room. You have to define where you've been, where you're going, how you're going to get there, and more importantly, how are you going to measure progress? That's the kind of leadership style that I bring. One weakness to that leadership style is when you want to involve the voices of everyone, it does slow down the process. But in my experience, it has shown that you have more success with individuals following and individuals actually completing the task. Because one thing about being the mayor or in an executive leadership, whether that's in private business or that's in public business, is you have to understand that you don't do the job all by yourself. And so you have to empower your team and you empower your team with information and making sure that their thoughts and ideas are included from the beginning before you go down that path. Thank you. Ms. Hardesty? As far as leadership style goes, working for Fortune 500 companies all the way down to service companies to small independent companies with less than 100 people in them, I'm definitely a team player. I've always worked in groups and teams of multi-disciplines, which means we don't all have the same background, we don't all have the same education, but together we have to use a method or a plan or a roadmap to listen to each other to find out what we're doing, Identify the problem or the question we're trying to solve, create a plan on how to do it, whether that be with timeline or a budget, and then you work together to execute it, even if that means divvying out tasks and putting it back together. That's the scientist in me, and that's the part of getting from A to B successfully so often. As far as one of the things I've also gotten as far as my background is we always take diversity and inclusiveness. I know at Chamber of Commerce breakfast, I think it was a breakfast a couple months ago, the head of diversity and inclusiveness came and gave a talk at the Chamber of Commerce, and it was wonderful to hear that because you have to take everybody, whether it be discipline, whether it be background, whether it be the country you're from, any of the above, and those all go aside to reach a common goal. And that's definitely something that Lyman needs. We need to work all together to reach a common goal to make this city as best we can be. He mentioned weaknesses, and the one I can think of, and I hope it's not a big weakness, but it is some that are concerned about, I have no government background, and I have no civil service background. Ms. Smith, follow-up? Number one, I think it's important to have a government background, particularly in this environment. There are tons of laws and regulations that have to be followed um, at this leadership level, and we need someone with the knowledge of those things and, and how those things work. Um, the second thing is I, I find it very interesting, and in fact, I'm confused um, about Ms. Hardesty's background. When we first started this debate, um, and this conversation about who was going to be Lima's next mayor. She talked about being a geologist and said that the next mayor did not need to have any business experience or a chief executive office level experience. And now all of a sudden she's this, you know, uh, businesswoman. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what changed? And in addition to that, you know, two weeks ago when asked about diversity and inclusion, she stated that Lima was diverse enough and we didn't really need um, anything more with respect to making us more diverse. So I, I'd like you to respond to that. Interesting. Your um, rebuttal was so long, but first and foremost, I've always claimed to have a business background. That's one of the parts of being a scientist and working for Fortune 500 companies. You get to be part of training so that you understand what every single piece and every single aspect does. So yes, I have a very strong business background. Second, as far as government roles, Berger ran 11, 32 years ago on the fact that he was something different and he had no government experience, and everybody loved that. I think I'm definitely bringing something in that doesn't bring the biases, it doesn't bring anything that's been previously done, it doesn't bring any outside negative impact or relationships with it. So I think it's fantastic being the hometown girl with an outside vision coming to bring something different. As far as government regulations, trust me, when you're drilling $300 million oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico, you have plenty of government regulations to follow, as well as planning and reports to give. So I've got plenty of experience doing that. 
Thank you. Ms. Hardesty, the next question will be for you to start with, and it is going to target uh, our local policing community and has also has multiple connections to it. There's been talk about defunding police and enhancing community policing in our community as a whole. How do you reconcile those two pieces, and how do you see the community and the local police relationships improving both in the minority and in the majority community. You said defund. What was the second one? Uh, defunding the mm -hmm. police and community, what we call community policing. Okay. Um, first and foremost, I'm endorsed by the FOP, and you will never hear me say defund the police. Um, as far as what has happened with our LPD and our force here, they are understaffed and therefore they cannot get to everything that the city of Lima currently needs. So we need to make sure that we find a way to get them fully staffed, back up to being able to answer every single call, whether it be a local person or a community member, a business, mem a business owner, or anybody who needs help. As far as that goes, I plan on adding a director of safety services to my staff. I think this is an imperative position to make sure that not only am I in tune as mayor with everything that's going on, they can also help the police chief and the fire chief make sure that they're getting personal or PR stuff, they're getting recruiting effort help, they're going to the academy so that we are getting the officers that we need. We're making sure that people who are interested in taking the test can actually have access to it, access to study guides, to pass it, and that we are picking the correct people for the job. So I think that's a very important position to add to my staff to make that to make that an idea point that we have to fix the crime in this city before we can do a lot of other things. Um, your other question was how can we help with relationships? So community policing is seen as a secondary task. So currently the LPD uses pinpoint policing, which definitely needs to be looked at and reviewed for its effectiveness. I will gladly say that publicly. It needs to be reviewed and looked at to make sure it's working. Community policing was used in the 90s when I was growing up, and we remember many of the community buildings. The one I think of is on Kibbe. And it's putting a police officer in the community so that they get to know that community people. That's wonderful when we have 90 officers and we can do that while other officers are still patrolling the streets and going to the calls needed. So I think community policing is a wonderful secondary measure that I hope to get to. But in the meantime, we have to get rid of the crime and we have to get rid of the drugs now. Ms. Smith? I'll start out by saying you've never heard me either say that I am going to defund the police. In fact, I have been consistent about talking about hiring more police officers. In fact, I am currently working with our finance direct director and our chief of police to add police officers to our police force. We just introduced three new officers at our press conference this morning. There are three other officers down the pipe, and the budget for next year includes six more, and then there's a projected budget for six more police and fire for year 2022. And so I am fully committed to making sure that the police department is fully staffed. I'm also fully committed to make sure that they have the necessary resources, and that includes tech technology to be able to keep our streets safe and to be able to be do more what I call predictive policing. And then with respect to community policing, community policing is not just a substation. Community policing is being out in the community, in the neighborhoods, getting out of your patrol car and building relationships with the community so that we can be preventive about crime as opposed to responding to crime. Those additional police officers will allow us to do that. With respect to the safety services director, everything that Ms. Hardesty describes is what the current police chief and the current a fire chief do now with respect to recruiting. Every time there's time for a new recruitment officer, there is a class where individuals are shown what is on the civil service test and they are walked through that process. And before I hire another bureaucrat to be over the chief of police and the chief of the fire department, I would use that money for more officers instead. And I know she's going to say that she's going to use the money for the chief of staff, but I'm still trying to figure out how you're going to pay a safety services director um, 
that is going to be over the police and over the fire with the salary for the chief of staff, and the chief of staff makes less than the police chief and the fire chief. Thank you. A rebuttal? I would just say with respect to that, yes, many of these programs are in place. However, I know they have study sessions, and I would just question, how well are they working? Why are we having problems hiring officers and firefighters? Why are we not getting the people we need? And why are they asking all the time why we don't have minorities in our department? So I'm not so sure these programs that are in place are working the way they're supposed to be. It's not because people are not passing the test. All right. We will uh, move on to the next question, which will be Ms. Smith. We're going to stay focused on policing for a minute, and I know that it was partially answered in this last segment, uh, but we're going to drill down a moment and ask what strategies do you see for bringing finances together to a fund to fund additional officers and how do you see that enhancing the community and the community members and the policing police department's relationships again i think we need more police officers on our streets so that we can have a more robust community policing program. A community policing is more than coffee with the cop. Community policing is more than having a substation in a neighborhood. Community policing is the ability of police officers to get out in their cars and build relationships with individuals that are in the neighborhoods. You can't do that when you are understaffed. And so again, it is very important to me that we increase the number of police officers on our police force. With respect to how do you pay for it, we pay for it out of our current general fund. Um, the numbers that I talked about with respect to hiring new police officers, we've already projected that our budget will be able to sustain those new officers, um, not just for the next two years, but also going forward. We've been able to do that through attrition. Um, so one of the things with respect, you know, even, even to COVID, it was a horrible thing that happened in our community, but by attrition, not just in the police force, but in other areas of city government, when people retired or left the city, we did not rehire, which means that we were able to build up our reserves to now go out and reinvest that money into our safety services. Ms. Hardesty? With respect to funding, I'll start with that. Yes, the city does have budget to do that. They did put everything on a hiring freeze when COVID came, and there's definite money there to hire new officers. It's just a matter of getting the right people for the job. We're not recruiting, and this did not sneak up on us. This did not sneak up on the current administration. This has been an ongoing thing for years that we have not been able to fill positions in our safety services unit. So this should not come as a surprise. As far as how to get people here, definitely as far as the officers go, we do have the funding, but they need to be staggered in. So you don't want to hire a class of 10. You want to hire a class of two or three, train them or let them be part of the LPD or the fire department for six months to make sure they're under the belt so you don't have all newbies. It's very similar to my experience on a rig. You don't want to have a rig crew that's all new people that don't know what they're doing. You have to have the mentorship and the leadership there in place to make sure that the new hires you're taking on can get trained properly and can be ready to work before you bring another class in. So besides that, as well as going to the academies, which I strongly recommend we need to do for hiring, then those would be my two recommendations. So I will just say that under our current process with civil service exams, our civil service list is good for one year. And so we do stagger with hiring of police officers. We bring in three and we let them get through. Then we bring in three more and we let them get through. And so the list lasts for an entire year before you have to go back to another list. I would just say that the Civil Service Board, while it's good use, and yes, we have tests and they can pick who they think is good, it also needs to be looked at as far as hiring from outside of Lima. At the current time, the police chief can only be replaced by two people. Well, if one retires or decides to retire early, the second person automatically gets that. And sometimes that's not the right answer. I understand local experience is important, but for some of these positions, they're telling me that the security for the United States of America wouldn't be qualified or to come and work as the Lima police chief. So I think we do need to broaden our horizons to be able to get the best people for the job. 
Under the current system, majors are the officers that are eligible to apply to be a police officer. There are three majors in the police department, so there are three people that would be eligible. And with respect to hiring the police chief from outside of the community, that is a decision that the voters made when they put in the city charter that the police chief comes from within the ranks. And like I stated in the last debate, if that is something that the voters want to change, then the voters can go to the ballot box and get that changed through the city charter. Except this administration has never taken that to the voters. Okay. This administration has been busy working to um, reduce crime, seriously? which we've done in the last 14 years by more than 36 percent. We'll, we'll stop there for a second. And we will take a second to uh, prepare for the next question, which will be Ms. Hardesty. And that question looks at the relationship between the county and city governments, the opportunity for shared services that may or may not exist now, and in addition, how can those, how can the city and the county work together with state officials who have leadership positions to make a difference for the city of Lima and our larger community? So first, as far as, as, far as relationship with the county commissioners and working as a county, we definitely need to have that be a hand-in-hand -hand relationship because all the way down from snow removal to how we're going to spend funds to fix buildings like Memorial Hall, the city has an impact on that and the county has the control over it in essence. So we have to work together in order to make that happen. I feel we have a great group of county commissioners in place right now. I feel they are very educated in what they do. They are very reliable in what they do. And I very much as mayor look forward to working with them as well as not bringing in anything that has happened in the past. As far as all of my decisions will be made from day one as brand new. As far as other ways we can work with them to help the city, we have areas right now, there's at least two of them that Allen Economic Division, Allen Economic group has worked in order to get in and it's areas where businesses can move in such that the city is going to get income tax from these people but the county is going to it's not in the city limits but the county is going to get the property tax so that helps bring income into us it also gets land that we don't have here Lima can't expand we are surrounded by the townships so in order to get some of these businesses who need more land, this is the option. We currently have those. We provide all the water. We also provide all the fire and policing for those, which is something I think needs to be looked at as that also expands the fire chief's responsibilities. And I think that answered the question. Ms. Smith? I'll just say that we are at a point of history in our city where we can actually see the hard work coming out of the ground that was contributed to by both city and county officials. And I understand where we are, and I also understand where we need to be and how we're going to get there. And that's going to take all of us. That includes the county, that includes the townships, and that also includes the city. And quite frankly, this conversation about city versus county is the same conversation that we were having four years ago during the last mayoral race. And I'm really not interested in having it because number one, it's not factual. There are many, many initiatives where the city and county work together now. We have shared law enforcement initiatives. We have shared fire initiatives. We do work with the county with Allen Economic Development Group to not only find opportunities within the city for individuals to come and do business, but also outside of the cities. What you're talking about is the business part. I have a track worker are working collaboratively across aisles with different people that don't always agree with me. Since I've been here, I've worked with our county commissioners on several issues, and I don't bring baggage to those relationships. And so as mayor, I will continue to work collaboratively to make sure that we're all making the best decisions to keep our community moving forward. Ms. Hardesty, a rebuttal? Just one example I'd like to say, as she mentioned, policing as far as the sheriff, Allen County Sheriff's Office goes. So the city of Lima lost our bomb squad to the sheriff. The city of Lima has lost multiple LPD officers to the sheriff's office. So if we're working so well together, why are we losing officers to go to the county? 
We did not lose the bomb squad. That was a shared agreement between Sheriff Treglia and Chief Martin about how we as a community can improve services and reduce costs. The same shared collaborative model that you were just talking about five seconds ago. All right, we'd like to move forward to our next question, which will go to Ms. Smith. And it's a continuation of the last, because I think it kind of got lost in the larger conversation in regards to the county city. And I'm going to reframe it a little bit. We have the city, we have the township, we have the county. We have workforce development needs, and we have state officials who are in strong leadership positions inside the state. How do you see your office working across those three lines to grow workforce development in conjunction with the state officials who are in leadership roles? You keep open lines of communication and you always keep in mind that all of us as leaders, whether elected officials or just a you know, community member have a responsibility to do what's best for this city. Those are some of the things, you know, that I've done personally myself and I've seen, you know, the county and the city and even our state elected officials work together with. Um, with respect to funding that comes in for the state for brownfield developments, we, we call, you know, our representatives across the state and, and we find out what are the rules and regulations um, for this money that is coming in, these resources for our community, and we work through those to make sure that we can get those resources. Um, we're all adults, so I don't see an issue with being able to work with individuals at both the state level, the county level, and the township level. Ms. Hardesty? Um, first, I'd like to start with the fact that we are lucky to be from Lima and the fact that both the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House have ties and roots here in the Lima area. So that's wonderful to be able to work with the state people. As far as workforce development, Ohio Means Jobs is a county-funded program. They do a wonderful job of combining all of the jobs in the area, in the county, multiple counties, and then they help train people. They help match employers to individuals in order to get them a job. They help nurture that job so that they're just not there six months. They encourage them to stay a year or two years. They evaluate what is needed in the area and how we can work with the school systems and the colleges to fill that. So that entity is a fantastic asset to the area that we have. And I look forward to working with them as mayor to continue with that. Another example I'd like to give you working from state legislation is the small businesses. So state legislation has tons of opportunities and tons of programs set up to help minority small businesses, female-owned small businesses, first-time business owners, and all of these come from a state level. And so we have a wonderful group here in town that has, we have great small businesses and we need to continue to grow those. We need to make sure they can expand. And so some of these programs, we are gonna trickle down and we're going to benefit from, and we need to make sure that we have the right people in place to help tell these business owners where to go in order to take and uh, seize the opportunity to use these programs. I would just say that, you know, in addition to working with our state legislatures, we already have a track record. We're working with those agencies that Ms. Hardesty is referring to. It's the Ohio Developmental Services Agency, which is the state arm of community development. That's where you get the programs for brownfield development. That's where you get incentives for small businesses. We also work with Jobs Ohio um, and Regional Growth Partnership to help grow economic development in our state. So the work is a collaborative work um, that we're already doing to be able to bring in those resources and actually you know even the small business park uh, commerce parkway that is in our community is a result of those collaborative investments that have been made with city county um, as well as state officials um, there's also a workforce development board that works with job force job Ohio um, and Allen County Jobs and Family Services that looks at where are the jobs coming into our community? How do we connect our workforce and our educational system to make sure that our people are trained for the job so that therefore they can be ready to take advantage of those opportunities? So we're doing that work. We're collaborative now and I think our community can see the results of that. Nope, I'm good. Okay. So I'm going to beat a horse a little harder because I think it's an interesting opportunity. It's an interesting statement that's been made by someone in the community. And it goes 
a little farther. It goes like this. How do you plan to leverage this opportunity to bring about and engage a valuable partnership with the state of Ohio with our Speaker of the House and Senator, both the Speaker of the House and the Senate from Lima? I think we already answered that. Yeah, well, I feel, I think <laughs> the conversation here is to be more specific. Is there a relationship that exists? Is there a tool? Is there a strategy? Is there a conversation? Is there a growth opportunity that we have not identified? The only answer I think I have to that is that I'm endorsed by Senator President Matt Huffman, so I feel I have a great working relationship with him, but I do feel we've already answered this question very well. Ms. Smith? And then I can say that both um, Representative Cup and I are graduates of Ohio Northern University Law School, so I can always use that angle. But every time that I, you know, engage with both of them and, and I talk with both of them, you know, I talk to them about local issues. Um, as the chief of staff, I've been involved in numerous meetings that have included, you know, both um, Huffman as well as Cup, um, particularly with respect to, I know, both um, Cup and the city of Lima work to bring after school programs in a partnership with Lima City Schools. Um, in addition to that, I was, you know, um, in the room and in conversations, you know, three years ago with respect to redistricting. So I think, you know, it's picking up the phone and, and you call them and you invite them to lunch and you say, hey, this is what's going on in Lima. You know, we both have an interest in this community. It's our hometown. What can we do to work together to make sure Lima benefits from these opportunities? Thank you. Anything else? All right, we're going to reconnect now to the local city schools, the grade schools, the high schools, the community colleges, the colleges, the technical schools, private and private nonprofit entities that exist in our community. What do you see the partnership between the city of Lima and those entities looking like if you are mayor? And that goes to, help me, Ms. Smith. The schools, nonprofits, just all. The, the focus on education. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it would be your grade schools, your high schools, mm -hmm. your career centers, your local community, technical, and four-year institutions, both private and private nonprofit. So I've talked about over the last year um, a platform that is really has a, a, a huge focus on education. Um, although the mayor is not quote unquote in charge of education, I do think that it is the um, duty, so to speak, of a mayor to have a strong partnership with our schools. The number one reason for that is because of the connection between education and workforce development. If our children are not educated and prepared to have jobs that are of the future, then we can't attract businesses. We can't grow. And so it's very important that we have that relationship. And that is a relationship that I've worked on um, since I've been back in this community. I've worked with our schools to go to our state um, offices to bring in funding to increase FAFSA completion rates, to increase graduation rates. I've worked with our schools to start the after school program um, that we have now. In fact, that program started by a simple conversation that I had with our current superintendent. What resources can we bring to the school to help out not just the students, but also the parents as well? The other thing I think we need to do a better job with is strengthening access to pre-K as well as um, Head Start. We know that when children start out behind with literacy and math that it is hard for them to keep up. And so as mayor, I will work not just with our schools but with our other partners that are providing Head Start such as WOCAT and even our private child care providers to make sure that they have resources so that our children can increase with literacy skills and math skills so that when they show up for kindergarten that they are ready on day one. Thank you, Ms. Hardesty. 
Sure. I'm going to start by saying that I think our city schools are wonderful. I went through the arts magnet and graduated from Lima City Schools, and I'll go along that. I think we definitely need to encourage our high school students and even our as, long, as low as elementary school to find something you're good at. Get in the computer magnet. Get in the arts magnet. We've got wonderful graduates that can come back and speak to their good examples and their good education and how they ended up where they are. We've got numerous basketball players. We've got numerous figures, Hall of Fame members that we're about to induct tomorrow evening here at Lima Senior and doctors. So I think we need to really make sure that we're bringing back people from our community in order to speak and say what, how good it is. Stay in your schools. This is your encouragement on how to do it. As far as colleges go, I'd like to see a more interaction with the city government and the colleges. I know we've heard some issues walking neighborhoods about the loud cars, the racing down Cable Avenue. I'd really like to work with some of these colleges and these presidents to encourage them to send out an email saying, hey, by the way, you are part of a community. You're now living in rental properties that somebody owns. Make sure you're taking care of them. Make sure you respect your neighbors. Make sure you are being part of the community as even though you are a student. So I'd really encourage to nurture those relationships. Um, the other thing I'll mention as far as schools that we are doing well currently is Ohio Means Jobs does have job coaches in the city schools, in actually the township schools as well, and I think that helps to guide them a little bit, and it's just another resource. That's one thing that I'll probably mention a couple times tonight. The city has tons of resources whether it be for schooling, after city programs, small business options, how to buy a house, how to get financed. We have programs for everything that are already set up. You just have to know where to look. And hopefully my administration and people in it can help funnel things so that we can make that a little bit easier to find and have access to. I think in addition to building the relationships with our post-secondary schools in our area, we also need to reach out to those in our region. Currently, we're involved in a program with Bluffton College called Learning in Community, um, which we've been involved in in a couple years, where they take their students and they bring their students into the city of Lima to work with various nonprofits and even government agencies to help solve some of the issues that we have in our community. That's a program that the city of Lima has worked with with Bluffton College. I like to expand that program. The other thing I like to do is to have the city join an organization that's called Town and Gowns. It's very effective um, in Bowling Green with the relationship with Bowling Green and Bowling Green State University um, to where even the city is included as part of orientation and they have a section to where they can go in and talk to incoming freshmen about integrating into our community. Um, I think that Catching those college students is a great opportunity to get them interested in Lima, get them rooted in Lima. So therefore, once they graduate, they'll want to stay here. And as mayor, I'll take advantage of that opportunity. Ms. Hardesty? No, I think we covered it. The 11th question of the night is for Ms. Hardesty to address first. We're actually going to target some COVID conversation over the next several questions. It is anticipated that a large amount of dollars related to funding from the state to the state of Ohio may come to the city of Lima. Mm -hmm. What are your priorities for the new COVID related funding and how, you know, and how would you use it? I think there's a handful of things that we definitely need to. I'll start by saying that we do not have a solid directive as to what the money can be used for. I know the mayor has proposed his selected programs and what he would like to see done with at least the first 13.1, but we still have, city council has still tabled that because we don't have a solid directive to where it can be used. The other thing I'd like to say is all the money used for COVID needs to be a one-time spend. You can't create programs that you're going to have to then funnel money into every year. So we need to be very careful of that, um, which is going to be strange when I say one of the first things I would like to see it used for is to help finish Schoonover Pool so that we can get a pool back. Now, saying that and saying one time spend, each year the city of Lima does budget $15,000 for Schoonover Pool, and they've done that for years and years. So the fact it hasn't been open the last couple of years, we're not adding a new line item by fixing Schoonover Pool. I would very much like to see it. I envision making something like a true family pool in the parking lot where it is, put a splash pad, put a small area, keep as much of the old building as we can. We need to keep our heritage and our historical buildings here. Fill in the pool and put a parking lot there. That to me is the easiest answer. And I think it's in a good place. I was a lifeguard there and I feel it was always utilized to the max capacity that we can do and the city kids need it. 
Um, the next thing I'd like to see is as far as housing goes, we definitely have dilapidated properties that need to come down. We need to work with the county in order to figure out what we can do with some of the land banks that they took down and how we can get some, use some of that money to tear those down. And while I only have 30 seconds, the next thing I'd like to see is a budget for small businesses put aside so that it's money basically a loan from the city. If you have your grant money and you're about $100,000 short, I'd like to see that come back where we can loan it for two years and you get money back. So again, it's funneling back into itself. It's not something we're going to have to fund throughout the years. Thank you, Ms. Smith. So, number one, um, we have to respect the what we do know about the federal guidelines with respect to COVID recovery money. And that money is to really address the effects of COVID, particularly the long-term effects of COVID and what it has done to communities that were already suffering. That includes our small businesses, that includes our neighborhoods, and that also includes being able to use that money for investments that are long-term investments, investments in infrastructure, not necessarily a new program, but investments in infrastructure. Um, based on the guidelines that we do have, we do know that you can use that money for housing. We do know that you can use that money for workforce development. We do know that you can use that money for education. And so those will be priorities that I will make sure that that money is used under my administration. But the number one thing is making sure that we're safe from COVID. We're not out of the woods yet. And so whatever resources need to be um, allocated for that, whether that is retrofitting buildings with adequate air, air filtration systems, whether that is more PPE that we need to make sure that we stay safe. Um, we also know that a tremendous amount of our students, they lost learning because they didn't have access to the internet. They didn't have um, you know, Chromebooks, and while our schools did a great job making sure that our children stayed connected, there was still a learning gap. So I like to come alongside our schools and be able to help with education with some of that money as well. I also know that our healthcare industry has suffered in addition to that. You know, they are having trouble even recruiting nurses. They're having trouble with capacity. So we may need to make sure that we don't need to build even more capacity to be able to take care of individuals that are continuing to suffer from from COVID because our numbers continue to rise. And so, thank you. And do we have a rebuttal, Ms. Harris? It kind of goes with our topic as she was talking about using some of the money for healthcare workers. This mandate that's coming down that healthcare workers are gonna have to have the shot. Hospitals are already understaffed. We put a mandate in place, we're gonna lose about 20% of the staff that we already have. Therefore, we're gonna be in an even more world of hurt. Ms. Smith? I'm not advocating for a mandate, and that exactly proved my point, why we need to probably have that money to be able to take care of our medical professionals, um, our frontline workers that have been at the grocery stores, um, people that are delivering food to us at our doorstep because we're afraid to go outside. And so I think that the $26 million is a tremendous opportunity to make some long-term investments that our community has needed for a long time. I also know that the regs has specifically said that you can do neighborhood development in what's called qualified census tracts, which a lot of census tracts in our communities qualify for that. And so housing development and rehab is a priority for me as well. And so again, um, I hope we get the regs soon so we can know what it is that we can do with the money. Thank you. The follow-up on COVID is actually related to the last piece that you both responded to, so I'll give you an opportunity, and if, and if you feel like you've addressed it, it's your call. How do you reconcile the need for public safety of both employees of the city and the community as a whole with the uh, mandate and or personal choice to have a COVID shot? Me first. I definitely believe that every single... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's Ms. Smith. <laughs> my, my apologies. I just talked about, you know, COVID um, numbers continue to increase. Um, and while the numbers continue to increase, I think we need to follow the guidelines of both the Ohio Department of Health, the Allen County um, 
health department as well as our other medical professionals with respect of how do we stay safe and that is wearing the mask that is washing the hands that is also social distancing and while I myself am vaccinated and I do um, share information about vaccinations um, I am not at a place to where I would mandate vaccinations um, and in fact the city policy right now is you know we are not mandating vaccinations we're not mandating masks we are recommending both of those um, if we have an employee or an individual who needs to be quarantined or they've actually, um, you know, gotten COVID, um, we've been very relaxed with respect to leave time and making sure that the safety of our employees is number one. Ms. Hardesty. So I was just starting to say that I definitely do not believe in this mandate. I think every individual should have the choice to make their own choice. If you have underlying health conditions or if you have health concerns, I recommend you ask your doctor. They're the best person, they know your health, they know your status, that's who you should go ask. I also know that it does go into constitutional rights. I think it does take freedom away. I think it takes your individuality away to have choice over yourself. So I would like to see more people stand up like the rally in the square last week and fight for these rights to be there. If you choose to get vaccinated, great. If you don't, that's great. Either one is your decision. That's what I need to stand with and that's what I'd hope to fight for. The only thing I would say differently is that if you choose not to get vaccinated, I don't think that's great because 98% of the individuals that are ending up in the hospital are individuals that have not been vaccinated. But I still believe it's your choice. But I don't think it's great if you choose not to. The only thing I'd yeah. add to that is... A, I, that, I'm sorry. No, I get a rebuttal, don't I? <laughs> yeah, My mistake. That's okay. I said the only thing I would add is that if you have your choice, that's great. And if you don't want to get it, then you're taking on the risk. And with the new variants right now, I currently know more people that have it that have been vaccinated than ever before. So I kind of have a feeling from a science background that sooner or later, we all might get it. And take it at your own risk if you want the shot or if you don't want any of your shot. But it's still your choice. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hardesty, this question will be for you to start with, deals with the concept of right to work as well as labor unions. So we're going to put the two into one package. How do you support or do you support the concept of right to work? And how do you see labor unions benefiting the city of Lima and the Lima community as a whole? So I'm going to go with the unions. Unions are a vital part to the Lima community. We need them. They've been here around for years. They've done good work. We need them. We need stuff done in our city. And I think they need a strong leadership team at the administration building to be behind them. So I think that is, first and foremost, the important thing. I'm going to hit the elephant in the room, and everybody wants to know about the refinery issue. I would encourage any business to hire locally. It's always a fantastic thing when we get our people in Lima, Ohio hired, 100%. That said, with a business background, I cannot sit here and say that there's a support for businesses. There is a support for businesses' right to hire who they believe will do the best job. It's not something where two contracts are put in and companies are going to pick one or the other because of unions. They Companies put in contracts and the company picks the best thing and the best person or the best company and bid for the job based on 50 things of criteria. Most oil and gases are at least that. Trust me, I've looked through them. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that, I'll leave it there. Okay. Ms. Smith? So I would say that I 100% support organized labor um, for several reasons. Organized labor is the reason why we have, you know, a minimum wage. Organized labor is the reason why we have the Federal F Family Medical Leave Act. Um, organized labor is the reason why we have a 40-hour work week and, and um, payment for overtime and fair and decent wages and, and safe working conditions. So 
organized labor, I 100% report, uh, support. Um, I do not support right to work. Um, right to work is really um, rhetoric because right to work is really state legislation that goes against an individual's right to organize and form a union. Um, with respect to the current situation that is happening at Synovus, and I talked to this about this at the last debate, you know, I've talked with both our labor brothers and sisters, as well as the um, leadership at Synovus, and my conversation with both were the same, encouraging them to come to the table because that is what the collective bargaining table is for. It is for both the worker and the employer to come to the table and come to an agreement for safe working conditions, livable wages, and to make sure that we keep good jobs in our community. And that is what I've encouraged, and I believe that... Um, those individuals are the best two individuals that are in a position to make the decision that is right for our community. The other thing is with respect to making sure that we have local jobs for local workers and we protect the rights of workers. Um, as mayor, I will work with our city council to make sure that we have project labor agreements and community benefits agreements so that when companies come into our community that they are paying a living wage and there is a preference for local work. If we don't take care of our own, then we're in trouble. Ms. Hardesty? I have also had conversations with them, and the one thing with the refinery I'll say is that this was done before, this turnaround happens every four years, and that both groups are sitting at the table trying to come to agreement and to work towards how the union's side can put in a better bid in four years. And the other thing I would just like to remind the people of Lima, this decision's been made, and it's not going to change. So I hope we can come together and work to get next, the next turnaround in four years. Hopefully we'll turn out different, but I do want to say that it can't be changed. The next question will go to Ms. Smith, and this may be um, less, uh, I'm not sure of the topic or how um, politically, uh, you know, the intensity of it, but I think it's uh, something that obviously was important to an individual. Um, there's something called public records requests. And they want to know, as mayor, how do you see that being handled in your administration? And that would start with Ms. Smith. So public records requests um, can come in from anyone, um, really. and. The way that it's handled is those requests are sent to the law debar department for review and then the information is turned over to the individual that has asked for that records request. Um, that's how I'll handle um, I would just say that as a public servant, if elected mayor, then of course anybody should have the right to know how many hours you're working, how many hours you're not working. Again, we work for you. As mayor, we work for you. You should have the right to have any information you would like to know. I don't see that any different than having a CEO of a company request your timesheet and have the right to question you if they don't think you're putting in the effort. Do you have a follow-up? Mm -mm. Do you have a follow-up? Mm -mm. We're getting close to the end of our time. We're about 8.15 as we finish our last couple of questions. This is a reminder that each candidate will have two minutes at the end to prepare, to share with you any last thoughts, observations, concerns, or information they want to be sure that you walk away with. Um, you know, we have about 100 people in the audience, and it's, you know, I want to give you all, give yourselves applause for coming tonight, because I really think it is... A really positive thing to see this kind of turnout, to see the energy, to see people listening and allowing the conversation to happen. So the challenge to you all, as this person writes, what do volunteer or what role do volunteers play in a community development plan? What is the main priority for where community members can become involved with city planning? And I believe that starts with Ms. Hardesty. As far as where does volunteering fit in our communities and in our neighborhoods, my easy answer is everywhere. It takes a community to run a city. It doesn't take a city to run a community. 
And so if you're putting time and effort into cleaning up your neighborhood, into running for city council, into making sure that your school bus stops are safe, nobody's running the red light for a school bus, all these little things add up, and to me that considers volunteerism. You're doing something for your part of the community. Um, the other part of the question was city... Really, fo <clears throat> excuse me, really focusing on the development, a community development plan and how individuals can be involved. So we do have a director of community development in the city office, and I think that reaching out to them as well as other programs that the city currently funds, which there are a multitude within the neighborhood associations group, the city gives money to the one hosting us tonight, LACNIP, and I think that that continuing support from the administration to helping the neighborhood groups work and thrive and get people involved is, is important and imperative to a successful community. So I believe that the government, whether that's local government, state government, or federal government, works for the people. And I believe that we're only as strong as the people, but it is our responsibility to make sure that the people are informed, and it is our responsibility to make sure that the people um, care about what's going on within government. And the way you do that is by opening up to them and reaching out to them for opportunities to participate. And so that means um, vacancies on city boards. That means um, also making sure that they're involved in the budget process. I said in a debate before, I would like to move what's to what's called participatory budgeting. And what that means is that when we lay out our budget that the public has more than a couple council meetings to comment on it and see where our priorities are. You know, right now the public sees the, bu the budget, you know, when we get to the first yard line, they need to see the budget when it first comes out. Um, in addition to that, I think we need to provide more opportunities with respect to how we allocate other resources. Um, being able to put more people on boards that are representative of our neighborhoods and all of our community stakeholders to be involved in that decision-making process and move toward a more shared government model. Um, we do work for you and government is your government and so your voice is important and the reason why your voice is important for me is because I want you involved. I understand that city government can't do the work all by themselves. Ms. Hardesty? No. Nothing? Ms. Smith, anything additional? No. All right, we're moving to the last question of the night and it actually, uh, there were some single questions that were kind of hard to sprinkle inside of other places. Um, so I'm going to give you the topics, and then we'll try to make a reasonable question out of it. And Ms. Smith, it'll come to you first. The concept of diversity, um, the concept of small businesses, and the issue of unemployment. So those three things we're going to tie together here in a second. All right. And I'll read them just as they're written. Okay. okay? okay. What can be done differently to recruit more minorities as city employees? What types of small businesses are in most need in Lima? With unemployment looking more like a decision than a lack of job issue, what is your plan for building workforce and keeping citizens employed? So I'll read those to you both again so you can kind of process this. What can be done differently to recruit more minorities as city employees? What types of small businesses are most needed in Lima? And with unemployment looking more like a decision than a lack of job issue, what is your plan for building the workforce and keeping citizens employed? Ms. Smith? Okay. I'll start with building the workforce. And I think with building the workforce and keeping citizens employed, that starts with the relationships that we have with our schools as well as our secondary um, educational providers. Um, I know that the Bureau of Labor Statistics recently put out a report, and with respect to the top 30 growing jobs um, in the United States 
uh, for the next 10 years, all 30 of those jobs require a bachelor's degree or higher. And so we need to work more with our colleges and our universities to make sure that our people have a degree. In addition to that, the top jobs that help people build a middle class income are those jobs with skills. And so we need to work more with our labor unions and our trades and continue to create additional apprenticeship programs and opportunities to connect people to our workforce. With respect to the types of small businesses that are needed in our community, I think we need more individuals that are actually involved in producing goods. We have a lot of service um, industry small businesses, but we need to get back to individuals producing goods and being able to put those goods in the marketplace, not just in Lima, but also all across the country. I think the internet and the advancements in technology have provided us a tremendous opportunity where you can live anywhere and work anywhere Anywhere. And if we can give individuals the skills as well as resources, meaning the space um, and the know to and the know how to be able to create products, I think it will help our community go a long way. And then with respect to minority recruitment, I think we need to develop our relationships with some of our historically black colleges and universities. I think we need to continue to work on increasing um, diversity within our workforce. I know that for minority communities, whether you're talking about Asian communities, African American, American communities, um, Indian communities, when people see individuals that look like them, that they can relate to culturally, then they are more inclined to come in to work into an area. Thank you. Ms. Hardesty? I'll try to do them in the same order just to make life a little bit simpler. So as far as workforce and employed, um, one of my good friend's dads always said, professional results in daily effort. It's an acronym for pride, which is what the Lima City Schools slogan is. And that's something that we need to keep in, in mind. We need to make sure that our students are educated and that they have the resources they need to have an idea of what they want to do maybe afterwards or to be given direction for what they want to do because not everybody goes to college. We have to face that. Yes, it's great if you do, but the trades are just as much needed and that's very important, especially to middle America community like ours. The other things I think we need to look at for workplace is we need to make sure that people are being treated well within their workplace. So I know that we've, I've talked to various people and they say they don't necessarily want money, they just want a little more respect in their workplace. So how can we come up with some programs for maybe guidance or counseling for business owners in order to learn how to treat employees and how to treat them equally and make sure that that's all at a level playing field? As far as small business goes, I held a small business forum this week, and I have asked, I've asked multiple organizations in town, do we feel we have a place where we're missing small businesses? Do we need more boutiques? Do we need more coffee shops? I said those two because I'm pretty sure everybody's answer is no. However, and she hinted at it, I've said before that we need feeder companies. We have, for instance, three plastic companies here in the city of Lima. So what company can make a part that those guys need? Or what company can make come up with an entrepreneurship program in order that these people can filter into these companies? We've got tons of industry around. Can somebody come up with a way here in town and get funded to make a bolt that Ford can use? All these little things that, yes, mass production might trumpet, but a small company that can feed into the companies here in Lima would be very beneficial and it would be a win-win for both the big company and the small company. Quick thing as far as diversity goes for the workforce, I am definitely a person that the best person should get fit for the job and hopefully we can help encourage people to know that. Ms. Smith, a final thought on that, those questions? No, sir. Ms. Hardesty? Nope. With that, we've covered 17 questions, I think, which is pretty dynamic, and applause to you all for writing some good ones. Um, as we're finishing up, uh, Ms. Hardesty will have the opportunity to start with her two-minute kind of closure summary and things that, she, wa that you, she wants you all to remember about her, and then we'll follow that up with Ms. Smith. And then before, as they finish, we'll have some final words. So, Ms. Hardesty? Sure, thanks. And thank you to everyone who took the time out to come and listen to both of us. I think it's pretty clear that we have two very different directions on how to lead our city, and I hope you guys cast your vote for whichever one you think is right. 
Um, but above all else in this election, you need someone to lead and to serve community that only a candidate in the race with real world experience. You need someone you can trust. You need somebody with a business background because a city should be ran like a business. In order to do this, it, in order to take us down a path of prosperity and rebirth for Lima, you need someone like this. I am a successful businesswoman and I am uniquely prepared to lead us. I have been proud to be a Lima resident and graduate of our schools for over a hundred, <laughs> proud graduate of our schools over the last decade, our city has lost its way. And our city is tired of the same old politics that has lost the prosperity drift away over the past 30 years. Instead, I offer a bold change and a fresh vision for our city. I will use my experiences to help reinvest in our communities and bring jobs to our area. Lima has some of the most talented people in the entire state, and we need to foster that talent for the good of our local community and growth of our in our economy. Today, our city is not prepared to solve critical problems, nor sees the new opportunities before us. One of the ways that we do that we improve the community is by helping reduce the crime in our area. We need to ensure our law enforcement officers have the tools they need to help us combat this problem. We need someone who will defend, not defund our law enforcement, as we both mentioned, and our essential services so that we can keep our streets and neighborhoods safe. We need people in nearby Indiana and even Michigan to come and realize that Lima is a safe place for them to live, work, and raise their family. We were once a vibrant city, and I'm confident that with the right leadership, we can once again thrive. I'm going to give our great community the opportunity to lift itself up and stand for what we believe in. We need people who truly care about our community and aren't just accepting a political push into the job. We need a leader who will stand for individual rights and fight big government mandates, and I promise to do whatever I can to do that. Thank you all for being part of this conversation. My name is Sharita Smith. I have a bachelor's degree, a law degree, a master's degree in business. I'm a lawyer, a former criminal court magistrate, and I serve as the city's chief of staff. My being here tonight, my story is an unlikely story. By the time I was 21, I had three children, all in diapers and daycare at the same time, and I struggled to build a successful life, but I've always worked. I worked my way through college, through 16 weeks of chemotherapy, stayed overnight in hospitals with a sick child, and the next day went to work. For the last four and a half years, I've been working with you all to help make this city better. Together we've made real progress, progress that we can see. Our downtown has come alive. We've started the work to rebuild our neighborhoods. Just this past week, there was an article in the Lima News about our real estate being the best it's been in over two decades. Four years ago, there were 1,500 jobs available. Today, there are 2,200. And as mayor, I will build on that progress. I'll work to prepare our workforce for jobs that pay a livable wage. I'll create a citywide suburb employment program for our youth. I'll continue to partner to recruit new companies, but I won't forget about our small businesses because they need our help as well. And I'll continue to invest in our police force, including hiring more officers and making sure that they get the resources that they need. I also propose two and a half million dollars in housing investment that would include down payment assistance, incentives for developers, and support rehab, particularly for our seniors. I'll let the world know that we're not lost in middle America. And contrary to what my opponent has said, that we need to bring back our pride, I will remind us all that our pride has never left. Lima, we know what happens when people work together. We get things done. And I'm asking you for your vote on November 2nd to lead you to continue to get things done in our community. Thank you. All right. What we'd like to do at this time is remind you that it's not too far away for election day, right? And it's your responsibility to be there and share your desire for a given candidate. We also need to recognize again the courage, the tenacity, and the emotional responsibility that it takes to sit up here and be one of these two candidates, no matter what side you're voting for. So at this moment, let's give them a round of applause one more time. And thank you all, and have a good evening.